Welcome, Real Vision audience. I'm delighted to introduce Meb Faber, uh, founder of Cambria Investments and the wildly popular Meb Faber podcast. Um, Meb, I'm going to probably start off with a difficult question. You know, I actually love that to me, what permeates through everything you do is a sense of praxis. You really like to scratch your own itch. Um, you, you explore areas and solve your own problems. So I'm going to start off with, you know, I see your books in the background. Why do you hate Amazon? Oh, man. <laughs> We already going down this rabbit hole, huh? Uh, you know, I emailed Jeff the other day <laughs> and uh, he seems to have cleaned up part of the problem. We'll see if it's finished. You know, Amazon, the challenge publishing uh, is they don't assign a single skew to every item on there. And so you have books. If you're an author listening to this, go type in your own book or your, your favorite author and you'll see 10, 20, 30 variants of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, none of which happen to be from the correct publisher, published in the correct year. So I complain about it. Nothing seems to change much, but hopefully they, they get their act together. The nice takeaway is all my books are now free uh, to download because we just had enough and said, look, you can, you can uh, download this. So listeners, please don't go pay $100, $200 for my books on Amazon from some seller in the Philippines uh, when you can just download them for free. Great. And you've been doing your podcast for a long time. What year did you start your podcast and roughly how many episodes have you guys done so far? Oh man, we're 300 in maybe. Uh, if I had to guess three, four, five years ago, we were sort of the second wave, not sort of the Rogan Ritholtz era, but uh, kind of the, the second uh, wave. And ironically enough, we'd considered doing video in the beginning. Back then video was, was a lot tougher than it is now in, in Real Vision. You guys do such an awesome job. Um, it, uh, but we started out with audio. So maybe three, four, five years. Started out with blogs and academic papers, then books, and now the, this modern era of everything else in between. I'm curious though, when you started, were, were people saying podcasting's a fad? Did it feel like there's too many podcasts out there? Why start a podcast? No, it, it, was, uh, it was actually immediately obvious as a consumer of podcast that uh, it was gonna make a lot of sense. Um, most people tend to consume it while doing something else, right? Whether walking the dog, uh, exercising, driving, whatever it may be. Hopefully they can listen to this. Uh, you know, I, I speak a little slow, one and a half, two X, three speed. So you can get through this interview in like 10 minutes. Um, but I think people, uh, it's one of those obvious mediums that they took to immediately. Speaking of like scratching your own itch, like with the podcast, you've done a great job of trying to solve for like searchability or, you know, weekly putting out your favorite podcast. Like, do you think that's getting any better for trying to like, uh, to be a, uh, you know, aggregator or trying to find the best podcast and sift through those and help, help searchability in general? One of the topics we've been talking a lot about for over a decade is, is curation, you know, um, on so many different topics where it's just a flood of information. It's getting worse, right? Every day with your phone uh, across not just the platforms, but Real Vision is competing with CNN, which is competing with the Wall Street Journal paper, which is competing with TikTok, right? It's all this competing for attention. And the struggle is so much of it's just noise. We struggled with podcast curation, which is information curation in general. So we actually pay, we hired and pay someone. Uh, and part of his job is literally just to listen to podcasts and to, to rate the top two, three, four each week. And, um, you know, that sounds crazy. But if you think about all the time, you know, you spend waste, wasting listening to poor content uh, or things that you spend an hour on, said, man, I wish I had that hour back. It's frustrating. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. You know, you spend waste, wasting listening to poor content uh, or things that you spend an hour on and said, man, I wish I had that hour back. It's frustrating. 
So uh, I think there's probably a lot more machine learning AI that, that will assist there. But in general, it's so weird. Most, most podcasts, apps, they don't even have ratings. I've lived in a lot of places in my life, but as a long time listener to your podcast, you do an amazing job. When anybody says like where they're uh, zooming in from or, or, or recording the podcast, it always seems like you live there at one point in your life. So let's start back to like, where did you actually grow up? A little bit of a mutt, uh, born in Colorado, spent some time in North Carolina as well. You can hear a little bit of the, the Southern draw. I retain uh, college in Virginia, out to San Francisco, ski bum in Lake Tahoe, down to Los Angeles to start Cambria, pre-financial crisis, the last one, and uh, have been here ever since, 10 years plus now, 12, 13, 14, and uh, kind of got sucked into the beach lifestyle. So if anybody's listening is near Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, El Segundo, come say hello. And what did you study when you were at UVA? You know, I was a nerd engineer, uh, biotech, biomedical engineering. This was in the late 90s. So uh, for those who are new to investing and crypto and manias, uh, you know, that was me 20 plus years ago. I was trading stocks in class. And, and uh, the nice part about looking back on that time which was very instructive is, you know, I, I can see myself and so many people today, you know, not just young people, older people too, but the names were different, but the story was the same uh, for us. It was E-Trade rather than Robinhood. It was also tech and, and dot coms, uh, as well as biotechs and genomic stocks. A lot of similarities today, man, 20 years later, we had professors that were trading stocks during class, checking stock quotes, uh, exciting time. You know, bubbles are, are super fun. And so um, I, I was able to focus and, and graduate, of course, with all that was going on. But uh, I kind of had hand, hands in both sides of the bubble. You know, I, I was uh, an engineer in biotech and biotech was also uh, rip roaring because of the Human Genome Project uh, that was going on right down the road at Solera as well as uh, the um, with the government. And so I used to go sit in on the FDA meetings uh, not too far away and, and ended up in grad school at Hopkins, which is also right right in the midst of all that biotech and then uh, managed to time it perfectly and graduated in 2000. So, uh, you know, that, that was the absolute peak for both of those uh, bubbles. And, uh, you know, the biotech career, I started out as a biotech equity analyst. And so kind of the career became the hobby and vice versa not really focused on biotech uh, as much anymore. Uh, and they have kind of gravitated more to the quant side of the world, uh, partially because of all the pain and frustration of losing all your money as a trader and learning what not to do. You know, hopefully uh, when people, you listen to many of the great traders, we end our podcast with, you know, what's been your most memorable investment. And, and most people uh, that have been around for a while, it's often a scar. You know, and, and many of us who've been around long enough have many scars. And so uh, that, that period was certainly uh, losing lessons uh, in the dozens, if not hundreds, rather than just one or two. So uh, that colored a lot of, you know, our, our investment methodologies and ideas that we uh, implement today, 20 years later. Yeah, I appreciate it because we're roughly the same age. And it's amazing how many people like to, um, you know, talk disparagingly about the young YOLOing trading now. But like, we can easily remember when we were doing the same thing in the late '90s, where like tech, biotech, you know, even figuring out options on E-Trade was it was more complex than, and we didn't have all these, you know, uh, YouTube uh, tutorials teaching us how to, you know, short squeezes and 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 buying call options. But it's you know, like you said, it was a really fun time. But more importantly. Uh, the money you lose there, people are going to stick around and learn the game. And so it's it's incentivizing and that the emotionality to actually, you know, learn the game. I always think about um, a lot of people either learn um, initially through Buffett. So they end up being, you know, value investors or other people start with like the market wizards. And the best part of the market wizards is you find actually there's a lot of different ways to trade and you figure out the one that works for your personality. As a quant, it was there more of like a, a seminal piece to you than than different than Buffett or the market wizards? Yeah, you know, Buffett and others talk about this sort of inoculation where many of them just get it from an early age. I think I took the opposite approach where I just tried everything that didn't work and eventually just like stumbled upon uh, learning all the things that that didn't work for me. And, and that's part of the investing too, is that 
um, you mentioned, alluded to, there's many different approaches that work just fine for, for different styles and, and strategies. And it comes a lot down to personality. And in my realization through making a lot of the mistakes, uh, you mentioned, you know, trading tech stocks. And for me, it was options, options on biotech stocks. And, uh, but that colored and, and informed that I had all the behavioral biases that, that people talk about in the literature today, you know, the Kahneman, Tversky sort of, hey, you know, look at this crazy way people are overconfident. And you can just go down the list and I have, I can just check, check, check. You know, James Montier has a great book on the topic, as do others. And, you know, being honest about it and saying, hey, uh, I'm this way with, with money and investment. So let's put up some guardrails. And that's kind of what pushed me towards this sort of quant uh, world and strategy. And, and quant doesn't have to mean high frequency and uh, super complicated. It can mean something as simple as just having some basic rules and guardrails that keep you from doing dumb stuff, which is, you know, the number one takeaway with this whole, this whole game is avoiding doing the really dumb stuff. You know, that sounds super technical, I know, but uh, as, as seen with the recent family office that just blew up $30 billion, like not doing the basics of really dumb things, even, even the super smart uh, Nobel laureates, you know, people get, get caught up in it. And so making the mistakes, learning the problems that I had as a human that were, uh, coded into into my genome, you know, as a biotech guy, that that resonated with me and understanding uh, why we do the things the way we do, and so that started me down this road and process. So as far as uh, you know, inspirations, I mean, there's a laundry list of uh, books and and white papers. We we have an article uh, on my blog that's um, called something along the lines of like the learning to invest or the, and the number one investing book. And it was interesting because we polled the audience. We said, if you were to give, you know, a high school student uh, or someone graduating college that wasn't familiar with investing, so maybe a liberal arts degree, they want to learn about investing, what one book would you give them? And we got something like 300 different responses. You know, there's no one book really that stands out. And so even if you look at the top 10, you know, some people would answer things like security analysis. And I say, my God, you're going to give someone that book, like there's zero chance they finish it. Are you kidding me? Uh, it's also 100 years old. But, um, you know, there are a number of books in that sort of top 10 that I think would be would be seminal. And if you read the top five, you're probably further along than 90% of the people out there. But, but modern day, like you mentioned, like the podcasts, you know, we have a Spotify playlist from each year that has some of the best, the best podcast episodes. And uh, listening to those, which you could crank out in a month, you know, puts you probably ahead of 99% of MBAs you know, listening to the Real Vision video, same thing, um, puts you uh, leagues ahead of, of anything you probably probably learn in school. So um, I, I can't point to anyone in particular uh, that I think stands out. I can tell you my favorite book currently, if you ask me about investing, is, is Triumph of the Optimist. And we can probably get into that in a little bit. But um, that's like $150 book. So listeners, see if you can pick up the, uh, the, the book at a library or a used bookstore. But they also have a free version called the Global Investment Returns Yearbook that's put out each year in partnership with Credit Suisse. And you can find uh, uh, many of those online for free. Yeah, we're going to get to Triumph of the Optimist. And yeah, it's always hard when you recommend a book. It'd be like recommending Klarman's book that's like thousands of dollars if you could find it kind of thing. That's always sad. And, and part of that story is we'll talk about investor education later and, and you know the dearth of investor education or what we can potentially do about it. Um, one part I didn't want to skip, though, is you, you talked about an interlude in Tahoe there. So I want to give a, a shout out to our mutual friend, Brian Chaplin, who used to be a ski bum with you back in the day. But Brian told me you used to also have screens up there. So were you still day trading those days or were you trying to be the next Glenn Plake? Yeah, uh, both and failed it, failed it both equally and as spectacularly. Um, but I did time a year in Tahoe that was like a record snow year. So nice. uh, it was, you know, I, I worked for a startup CTA and uh, it was based out of San Francisco and they opened an office in, in Income Village, Incline Village, what people, the locals called it because, you know, half of Tahoe's in uh, Nevada. So there's a lot of tax benefits to being on the east side. And uh, some of the quietly best skiing in the Sierras is in uh, local mountain, Mount Rose, the shoots there. 
uh, but Chappy, shout out. Um, yeah, you know, I so I worked at this at this startup CTA, which is uh, now defunct, but um, certainly would go to work at 6 a.m. in my bibs and snow gear many a day to try to uh, get out of there at 2 p.m. and get a few hours in and, and then head to Garwoods uh, as well. But, you know, the some of the work I did there certainly informed the starting of Cambria, uh, you know, a couple years later, in particular, um, some of the early ideas on trend following, uh, as well as futures markets, you know, studying a lot of what many of the great traders had been doing for, I don't know, four decades at that point, you know, the turtles, the Jerry Parkers of the world, uh, that was the foundation for a lot of the work that we then eventually implemented uh, here as well. And when you started Cambria, were you starting with the idea of, did you start off with ETFs? Or you started off with like a white paper, I believe, right before the GFC, isn't that correct? You know, this would have been circa 2006. And so we had no idea what we wanted to be when we grew up. You know, I'm late 20s at this point, uh, been a ski bum, broke ski bum in Tahoe and, and started this uh, company with a partner who came from a VC banking background. So neither of us had started an asset manager. And so started out from zero. I mean, we're talking, you know, bootstrapped, nothing. First account, I had written an op-ed in like the LA Times or something, which I've never done before since. Don't even ask me why I did it. It was something about pension funds. And uh, I wrote an article, maybe as a letter to the editor, I can't remember. So our first investor literally came in through that venue. Uh, and I'd never been a writer, right? I'm an engineer. You guys know how engineers write. It's the most uh, dry and boring possible content there is. And so uh, I had happened to write an academic paper, which also was an unintentional uh, production because it was to try to get a certification, right? The, the CMT program. And so had to submit it because uh, it was expiring at the end of the year. So I wrote my first academic paper, uh, which at the time was called a quant approach to market timing or the case for market timing or something. And literally no one would read it. Uh, I'd sent it to a, a bunch of people I respected uh, in the investing world, luminaries, thought leaders, got back some really nasty responses, Nobel laureates, got back some thoughtful responses as well. And I'm now great friends with, with some of those people. Uh, but that paper came out in the journal Wealth Management, let's call it 2007. And at the time started writing blog and in and, and some books uh, as well. But uh, that one piece of content, which was unintentional, uh, really kind of paved the way for the whole business. Now, part of that was luck and timing. You know, the paper sailed through the financial crisis that the basic model uh, did just fine. And so it certainly got some attention. But from a from a young engineer doing a startup who who still still to this day writes like an engineer, uh, it was kind of the basics for the company. So two private funds, separate accounts. We transitioned as people started uh, getting interested in our investing ideas. They were kind of from all over, uh, not just in the U.S. but global as well. And and here today, I think we have almost a hundred thousand investors around the world. So a, a, a far cry from the L.A. Times op-ed, but. Um, we started doing public funds first as sub advisory, then on our own, starting in 2013. Uh, we have a dozen funds now. Uh, probably will settle in that mid-teens, 20 range. Probably, probably no more than that. But uh, it's it's certainly it's certainly grown from the uh, the days of uh, a couple of screens in Tahoe. That's for sure. Exactly, and a dozen funds now looking to do more. How many tickers though do you actually own? You know, you don't own the tickers. You can reserve right. them Where's from it? a couple years with an exchange. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're not trying to just uh, reserve hundreds. We want the ones that we have an intention to use for our funds. But it is certainly fun to, uh, to, to, to pick out some memorable tickers. So maybe two dozen probably. Uh, but, you know, we're a bit different when we think about funds and fund launches. And it's probably instructive to mention this real quick. You know, the there's sort of four criteria we think about in a world of 10,000 plus funds. And you know, this better than anyone is why do we need any more? You know, what, why does uh, someone have the audacity to think that they can beat Vanguard and BlackRock and, and launch a new fund. And the reality is we try to only launch funds that either a don't exist. So it's totally a new fund or strategy that, that there is not well represented or we think we could do it much better or much cheaper. 
and cheaper. It's rare in 2021, right? But uh, all of our funds are cheaper in the category average than some of the single cheapest fund in the category, which we're proud of. Um, but two is it has to be something where there's a fair amount of academic or practitioner research. So many of these fund companies just throw whatever they have against the wall, you know, the, the hot, whatever the hot strategy of the day is. And to me, I want something that goes back uh, preferably decades, maybe a century of research. And the two big pillars we really stand upon value on one side. So the Ben Graham, Buffett, but also momentum and trend. But it also goes back 100 years, time of, of Charles Dow uh, and, and Dow theory, and probably even before that, certainly to the time of, of Ricardo. Um, but then is it something I would put my own money into? As you know, most mutual fund managers have nothing invested in their own fund, which is a sad, sorry state of affairs. So we want to have some skin in the game. And lastly, does anyone actually want it? Which is a problem for us because we have a lot of pretty wonky ideas that no one on the planet would, would actually want. And so, you know, that's sort of informed what we've ended up launching to this point. Uh, and we have a handful of ideas. Hopefully, we'll put them out a, a few more this year, but usually it's usually about one or two per year. Do you try to pre-sell like to your audience those new ideas? Like, how do you kind of vet the market? Like now, you, like you said, you got a hundred thousand investors. You got a pretty good email list. Like, how do you vet to whether you should launch something or not? What the audience response is going to be? We did a hour-long podcast with Wes Gray of Alpha Architects on this topic of um, how to launch an ETF uh, because we get this question if not on the daily, certainly every week, where uh, people want to launch an ETF, right? They have a great idea. They see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And we kind of walk through all the process involved in launching a fund. Uh, the biggest takeaway for the people that want to do it is managing money and the business of managing money are two totally separate things. And uh, I think people see like the show Billions and you know they want to drive the Ferrari and uh, trade. Uh, it's exciting. And um, but the reality of running an asset manager, you know, is, is certainly uh, a lot more boring. Uh, there's a lot of forms to sign, compliance to deal with, chats with the SEC, who we love, uh, all those sort of things, right? And so um, trying to combine the two, there are a number of different ways to do it. So the best and the easiest, of course, is to have a seed, to have a partner that wants to put in a bunch of money or funds that you're cannibalizing. You're starting to see this a lot with mutual funds. You know, the active mutual fund space, uh, you know, is starting to cannibalize itself and move to ETFs. Uh, you've seen that with DFA, uh, you're starting to see that with a number of different structures. So if you have 10, 50, 100, a billion dollars that you want to move into the fund, that's the easiest, right? You've seen this with financial advisors, asset managers starting to say, look, I have a thousand clients that are in the strategy. I'm just going to wrap it up and put it into an ETF. Uh, it'll be more tax efficient or easier to run as one account rather than say, um, you know, a thousand separate accounts. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, harder, of course, is to launch something and let it marinate, uh, incubate it, and hope the world comes around to your idea or your performance. Uh, that's doable. It's going to cost you a couple hundred grand a year, probably just to keep it out there. So uh, the big shops do this all the time. Um, there's a stat, I think over a 10 year period, roughly half of mutual funds at the start of the period close or merge. So you think about that amount of um, turnover, right? How many of these fund companies that you're partnering with are gonna be around? Are they really doing it because they're launching a product they believe in or are they doing it because they wanna launch a product they can sell? And uh, I think that's an honest question that, that's easy to answer in most cases actually um, many of these fund complexes are willing to just throw everything out there uh, and then close it if it doesn't work and keep the ones that are open. So um, we try to launch products that we're going to keep out for you know a decade time frame. Many people can't really um, are sorry, it's not can't are not willing to you know commit to that amount of period. And so uh, and then even then it's hard, right? You launch a strategy or product and. You know, people used to come to me at cocktail parties when we had those uh, in the real world or coffees and they would say, Meb, but, you know, I, I invested in your fund. Um, it's not doing so great. You know, I've been in it for three months. I'm going to give it six months and see how it does. How long should I give it? What do you think? And I said, well, I, I used to say uh, 10 years. 
and they would kind of awkwardly laugh, like assuming I'm going to follow it up and be kidding. And now I actually say 20 because any investing strategy, asset class, people don't like to hear this. They hate hearing this, by the way. But any asset class or strategy goes through periods of, of underperformance. And if you look at the history of the best performing asset managers uh, over 10, 20 year period and look at the percentage of time they're in the um, bottom quartile or they have years of underperformance. In some cases like Buffett, it's like can go on five, 10 years in a row and uh, but still be viable. The Buffett example I love to give is back to 99. You know, he's outperformed like 99% of all mutual funds, but uh, has underperformed the vast majority of those years and certainly at length. And so um, the challenge with launching any strategy, you can be stuck in a regime. And an example I like to give, people say, well, no, that's crazy. Uh, there's a institutional survey that said something like 90% percent of institutions when asked how long they'll give a manager uh, before they'll tolerate underperformance and 90 percent said three years which is everything that's wrong in asset management just summed up in one very simple poll and that's not people love to look down on retail and dunk on the the robin hood uh, wall street bets crowd but let's be clear the institutions are as bad if not worse uh, about this process and so um thinking in terms of a decade or two decade long period and people say, well, I, you know, I just, I need to find a manager. Maybe that's you, but I need to find a, a manager that will be more consistent outperform every year. And I say, look, what's, what's the single most widely held belief in all of finance and investing? Every investment book you'll read, every course, one-on-one level taught in college. We don't teach uh, investing in, in K through 12, which is a natural tragedy. We can get to that later, uh, but let's say we did. What would they? What would be the single first thing they would teach? They would teach that stocks outperform bonds. There's, I don't know a single person that does not believe that. Do you? I, I don't know anyone. And most people expect that though that they want that certainty on a yearly time frame. I mean, this year, whatever uh, day, week, month, quarter. But normally on a yearly time frame, maybe two to three years. And I said how long do you think stocks can go underperforming bonds? And most people would say a few years, five years. And I said, there's been plenty of times in history, they go 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I was like, you want a good example? In 2020, this isn't you know, the, the Great Depression. This is in 2020, stocks had the same performance as long bonds for the last 40 years. 40, 40 years. Um, that's a long time to wait for stocks to outperform bonds. But here you are complaining about a manager that's underperformed for six months. Sorry for this long winded answer, not even an answer, but just rabbit hole diatribe. As people think about an investing approaches and committing capital, I mean, going back to the old Robert Kirby coffee can portfolio, you know, setting up a realistic time frame on how to think about allocating, but more importantly, 99% of the time people spend is on the buy decision. What should I buy? Is gold a good buy? Should I, what about the Fed? How much should I allocate to US stocks or foreign stocks expensive? And almost never does anyone establish sell rules when they implement the buy. You ask people, we did a poll on Twitter, it was like 95% of people don't have any sell rule when they put the buy in place. And so why does that create problems? Going back to the beginning of the discussion with uh, you know, the behavioral side is people are just going to wing it. And so unless you have some parameters, what are you going to do? If it underperforms, you're going to sell it. Uh, if it outperforms, you'll leave it and keep it and maybe add more, right? Um, and that's honestly probably backwards the way it should be, ignoring all the red flags and reasons to actually sell. But but try writing it down, you know, listeners, for not only just your allocation, your manager, your stock pick, whatever it may be. And that's important because um, looking back at times in history, you know, and you start to panic what's going on, that that's when the fractures creep in and, and the bad performance uh, really starts to take hold. And in the really bad cases, uh, when when the entire thing goes down the, the drain. So thinking about these, and that's what happens when you think about 20 year time horizons, right? You can you can talk eloquently about them. And I think you brought it up, I, I think about it often is, 
I really wish we hadn't called them investments, that we'd call them savings because that's what they are, right? And we concentrate to get rich, whether it's our, our business, our employment, and then we diversify to stay rich. And that's our savings that we've accumulated that we need their, need them to be there when you need them. And I wonder if we're, by calling them investments, everybody thinks about the buy side. Like, I just want to buy something that's going to make me even richer instead of thinking about, I need these savings to grow you know, prudently over time. I think Tony Deedon said it recently, it was great as like portfolio managers, um, we should think about it more as a practice, like a medical practice. And we need to give the clients what they need, not necessarily what they want. Um, and I thought that was an elegant way of looking at it. But part of that is by having your dozens of ETF, your dozen ETFs, you get to see the flows going in and out. Is it just mind boggling seeing how much people are moving in and out of your ETFs? I would like to think that our investors are, are somewhat, um, we, for the greater part of the 12 years this firm's been around, we've had no sales team. Uh, we just hired some this year. Uh, so, uh, so most of the people that have come to us have come from some of the content or pre-selected based on our ideas, right? It's not someone, you know, selling them over a steak dinner, hey, you should buy these funds. It's usually people reading something, uh, coming to the conclusion on their own. So hopefully, uh, you know, I'd love to think my investors will be well behaved and, and do the right thing. But, um, but I think it's a struggle for all of us, you know, and, and we often ask people, do you have a written investing approach, policy portfolio? It doesn't have to be 50 pages like a, a Yale or a Harvard endowment would be. Maybe it can be one page. Maybe it's, hey, I got 60, 40, I rebalance it once a year and that's it. God bless you. Um, but do you have an approach and is it something that uh, you can share with your neighbor? We, we talk to people about this concept of like zero budgeting or uh, the zero budget portfolio where write down your ideal portfolio. Is it what you currently have? And it almost never is. People have what we call sort of this like mutual fund salad where they've um, think about your garage, right? All these things you've inherited over the years. If you went home, drove home tonight, pull into your garage, would you buy all those things tomorrow? Of course not. I mean, there's like a old aquarium that's been sitting there for 20 years. Like, would you buy that off Craigslist? No, you would probably buy none of it, but you have a psychological attachment to these investments. And so this sort of spring cleaning, it's a good time we're recording this is a chance to say, if I wipe this slate clean, had a blank portfolio, what would it look like? And then can I come up with rules of how I'm going to behave? What if interest rates go to 20%? What if they go negative? What if gold goes to 10,000? What if it gold goes to 100? What if crypto goes, you know, on and on and on? How would I adapt? And, and going back to a comment you made that I think is really uh, important is this concept of wealth preservation. And so we did an article, four part series this past year. It was called the Get Rich Portfolio, the Stay Rich Portfolio, uh, investing in a time of, of coronavirus. And lastly, was how I invest my own money and detailing specifically what I do with my money, which really should be irrelevant to most people. But people like to at least see um, voyeur in on, on how people think about it, I think is instructive. But, the, but zooming in on the stay rich portfolio, um, I mean, looking at the family office that just blew up this, this past couple of weeks, so many wealthy people, and you could go down the list. Uh, my favorite up till now was Batista, you know, in South America. He, yeah. he was also worth, I think, 30 billion. Yeah. And this concept of concentration or leverage, uh, you know, applies to so many people is, is the portfolio that often gets you to be wealthy is not really necessarily the same portfolio you should have when you have $30 billion. You don't need to be leveraging five to one uh, because the worst thing that can happen in our world is the same thing in a casino is you're, you blow up, you lose all your money because then you can't bet. You have no stack, you can't play, they kick you out. Maybe you get a free buffet ticket, but that's about it. And so it's interesting because this narrative has taken hold in a new place this year, which I hadn't... Uh, expected, but we had written this article about the stay rich portfolio because most people, if you ask them, we love doing these Twitter polls because it, I think it illustrates how most people think because they can be honest and anonymous is we said, you know, how big have, have the drawdown? So peak to trough loss on bonds been historically. And most people, you know, and, and T-bills included, most people said, you know, zero to five, 10% after inflation, by the way. And the answer for bonds is over 50%. So you lost over 50% at some point holding what most people consider to be the single safest investment. And so I said, let's do a thought experiment. Is there a way to construct a safer 
protection against inflation and, and losses based on a couple of metrics, biggest drawdown, volatility, one year loss. And it turns out that if you invest in what we call the global market portfolio, not too different from 6040, but basically invest some in stocks and real assets and bonds, it's actually a much safer wealth preservation tool. So it has a two, 3% higher return than just bonds or cash, but it actually has lower volatility, lower drawdowns, lower, lower one year loss, which is crazy for people to expect. And so no one in their right mind is gonna go invest their safe money. Uh, and this applies to corporate treasuries too. And so what this has been co-opted by the crypto crowd, right? They're saying, no, 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 you don't want to put your money in, in uh, cash and bonds because the Fed and inflation, you lose money, therefore you should put it in crypto, which is interesting and good that people are thinking about wealth preservation. My takeaway is a little uh, more um, unconventional than historical, but not quite as, quite as much as, as MicroStrategy and Sailor on it. But I said, look, you have to invest in a, in a, a portfolio. And the, at least the historical evidence is kind of irrefutable. It's a safer portfolio. Um, anyway, in neither case is it you should be, uh, there's an old William Bernstein quote uh, where he's like, you know, you don't have to keep playing the game once you've won. And so many people make this mistake of being wealthy, having money, and then continuing to risk it all for some elusive goal and having to think back about what's the point of money in the first place, right? It's, it's not um, uh, just to accumulate as much as possible as, as my mom used to always say, you can't take it with you, right? So uh, why is it there in the first point? And then how do you protect it? And so anyway, um, a lot of the commonly held beliefs, the first one we touched on, stocks outperform bonds, but also that bonds are safe or cash is safe, I, I think is is the safest investment is, is a truism that people repeat, but it's actually uh, pretty dangerous. And I know you agree with me on this. I, I've been talking about it for a while now. It's like, I think that I want to go like back to like a pre 1980s era where, you know, or, or pre the last 20 years where people can't look at their portfolio on their phone 10 times a day. I want them to go back to for having a safe portfolio for their savings and forgetting about checking their portfolio to go back to their daily lives and enjoy their family, their hobbies, their business, and forget about the savings side. We, we've co-opted this as a form of entertainment where people are, you know, checking their account 10 times a day. And, and it's just really, it's really sad at the end of the day for me. We did another article called um, the best way to add yield to your portfolio. And we kind of demonstrate, we walked through, we said, how much do you make per hour? How much time do you spend on investments per week? Here's how much alpha you have to generate to make up for that. And the takeaway was basically you should spend zero time on your investments. Look, if it's a hobby, it's what you enjoy doing. That's separate. But for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of institutions, they should set up an investing approach and just let it let it whir in the background and spend no time on it or very little time on it. In fact, we're like, look, if you spend this amount of time improving yourself, you know, continuing education, getting a better job, uh, applying or, or running a side hustle, um, how much you save and invest trumps what you invest in over the long period. And it's not even close. Like you just start to save and invest in your 20s or younger uh, that has infinite better outcomes than, you know, your alpha quest to get an extra one, two, three, four, five percent. People don't like hearing that because that's the boring blocking and tackling. Um, but setting up guardrails for yourself, you know, I, I joke that Vanguard has a user experience that's god awful. I, I mean, it's they're they're for a tr multi trillion dollar AUM company. You have an account at Vanguard. You're like, this looks like it was built in the 80s. This is horrific. And in part of me is like, this might be intentional. Like they want you to not come back. Like they're never going to have confetti when you make a trade. Right. Um, they're going to make this. So kind of, I, I joke the most alpha I ever generated in my career is I was transferring an account to or from Vanguard. It took like three months. It was during like the market downturn. So it was because of Vanguard so antiquated, but coming up with this concept of, you know, the coffee can, um, there's the modern equivalent, you know, like Betterment has this robo advisor that they they try to nudge you in the correct direction. You know, if you want to make a change in your allocation or a trade, they'll do a pop up and be like, hey, just FYI, you're going to have to pay some taxes on this. And they say a lot of people abandon it there because people hate paying taxes. Right. Um, so I think there's a thoughtful way to eventually push people in the right direction and behave. 
Uh, I don't have any easy answers on what that looks like yet. But um, but again, coming up with that written guidelines, I think, can be a, a good start. Yeah, I think you've, you've changed your mind over the years on difference between liquidity and illiquidity, where you always wanted liquidity, but then you've seen the maybe the benefits of that illiquidity premium or those guardrails and, and making it slightly difficult. I think we had a, a brief discussion in Fort Lauderdale once about, you know, I know you're working on like, how could you apply like PE style illiquidities and make sure you put guardrails on people's behavioral bias. I always wondered if people held like a basket of your ETFs at like interactive brokers per se, and then um, used it like an e-lock. So you were saying just be fully invested and use an equity line of credit that you can get that pass through at LIBOR with interactive brokers. Does that allow people to then just hold that notional portfolio value and just take little, you know, a few percentage points here and there for any sort of, you know, annual needs? Um, is that a way to solve that? Or have you come up with some better ideas about trying to keep people fully invested for the long term? So much of this comes down to psychology. You know, I, I'm of the belief that I'm happy investing all of my savings and checking his account, right? With, with the exception of day-to-day -day expenses on a monthly basis. But going back to that, what we talked about earlier on what's the safest account, I actually think that's quote safer and is gonna have higher returns than, than cash only. Uh, not a lot of people believe that, but, uh, but I do. And so coming up with a structure that, that and again, a hat tip to Betterment, but there's plenty that are just fine. Um, I, you know, I've invested in over 250 private companies at this point. And the beauty of that is once you invest in them in, in startups, like you can't sell it. Like there's no exit until they get merged or acquire or start paying dividends. And I love it because, you know, as you start to think about investments, um, if you look at the U S stock market, most of the research has shown that 5%, maybe 10% of stocks deliver all of the returns. The McDonald's, the Amazons, the Walmarts, the Googles, the Apples, you have this huge power law uh, outlier to the upside. And that's why the basics of indexing works going back to the 70s, you know, you do a market cap weighted index, you're guaranteed to own these winners. And historically, that gives you that 8% return, right? Um, two thirds of stocks underperform the broad index about half have no rate of return over their lifetime and about a quarter straight up go to zero, um, which is one of the reasons stock picking is hard, active management's tough. Uh, and so this, this basics of market cap weight and indexing and passive ind indexing gives you guaranteed to own the winners over time. And we can get into the problems with that, of course, but um, so you, you definitely own the winners, but what do most people do when they're uh, investing in stocks, you get a stock and it doubles. Hallelujah. I mean, you're excited. You're thinking about the vacation you're going to take. You're thinking about the house you're going to buy, going to the club, popping bottles. Right. Uh, but often if you look at, there's a, a couple of great books. Um, one is by, uh, Meyer on a hundred baggers. And there's a much older book on the same topic. And, the path a company takes to being a, not just a, a double, but a 10 X making 10 times your money. I mean, that's equivalent of Bitcoin going to 600 grand, right? The world would, would ignite if that happened, happens with stocks all the time, not just a 10 X, a hundred X, right? A um, hundred times your money. And so looking at these hundred baggers over time, what's the biggest criteria? Well, it takes like a decade. You know, these compounders, even if it's 20, 50% a year, it takes a long time. But the problem is most people, uh, Jerry Parker uh, of the old Turtles fame had a great quote. He's trend follower and I may murder it. Sorry, Jerry, but it was basically like um, people are, are uh, hopeful with losses and basically afraid with gains. Like they'll book the gains very quickly. And if you have a stock that doubles, uh, you take it out, right? And then it goes on to two, five, 10, 50, 100 X. You know, that's where all the money gets made. And it's really hard to do. It's really hard because it comes a bigger and bigger part of your portfolio. And so the hack that you referenced on it being private and the illiquid nature, people understand this with housing. Every single person listening, my parents bought a house for 50 grand. Now it's worth <laughs> 500 grand. This is why you make money on housing over time. Uh, and the modern equivalent is I bought a house for a million dollars. It's now worth two over the last year, you know, LA, my God, uh, it's tough to watch as a, as a local renter. Uh, but you know, it's the same thing with stocks. And so 
the private side forces you into that illiquidity. And so having a, a private mindset, I think is important, but how many of us are willing to give something 10 years, 20 years, Amazon, perfect example. How, how much is the media like saying, hey, look, you just bought this at IPO, you're now worth $100 million or something, but neglects the fact you had to sit through multiple 90% drawdowns, including I think a 95% drawdown yeah. on its way to multi-trillion. So uh, it's hard, but for me at least saying, hey, I'm going to do this in private startups, and there's actually a big tax benefit too. Uh, listeners, we don't need to go down this, but Google QSBS is essentially a, a massive uh, tax benefit to startup investors investing in companies with less than 50 million uh, market cap or gross assets. Uh, you, you can essentially uh, pay no taxes on that investment, which is incredible. And probably I think the most impactful tax legislation in the last 10 years that no one knows about, but, um, but it also has the beauty of you're stuck in it. So uh, it's, it's a way to, so much of this comes down to framing you know, uh, how do you think about it? Because once you think of in terms of I can't sell it, you don't spend any time thinking about it. There's no there's no there's no mental space in your head that's getting taken up by something you can't do anything about. Yeah, I wonder, like you said, the Amazon, only four people have held Amazon, right? Jeff, his parents and his ex-wife. And like, yeah. that's the only people that held through that, that whole time frame. I always wonder now about, like you're saying, housing was this, people don't realize it was a forced saving mechanism. And I have friends that are working on all these tech startups to like fractionalize home ownership and all these things. Like, I'm afraid we just remove that entire historical precedence when we make this a more financialized, liquid and fractionalized market. Do you have any thoughts on that? I agree. You know, um, look, the, the, the hard part and the motivation is, we want everyone to be an investor. Like there's no greater way to increase your wealth over time than investing in businesses or investing in assets that produce cash flows like real estate. We talk a lot on our podcast about farmland. Uh, you know, we come from a farming family in the Midwest. And so um, things that pay you, people love to think in terms of passive income, right? They, they picture themselves on the beach, sipping pina coladas and just getting checks in the mail. Uh, but the reality is that's true. You know, the, the Talmud, we wrote about this in our, our global asset allocation book, looking at portfolio allocations. And they were talking about this 2000 years ago. It said, let every man invest a third in business, a third in land and a third keep in reserve. And the modern equivalent, you know, to me is, is stocks, bonds and real assets uh, like commodity companies and, and real estate. But that's a pretty damn good allocation. And it's outperformed the vast majority of, of other allocations over time. Uh, but having that long time horizon and, and kind of sticking with it is, um, you know, there's a couple areas that I think real estate for some reason generates a weird um, thought process that doesn't translate into other areas. I think people get it when it comes to real estate, you know, because um, real estate's not particularly like that fantastic of an investment in and of itself. You know, it's fine on a, on a sort of nominal basis, it keeps up with bonds. If you rent it out, it keeps up with stocks maybe over time. But the whole key is, is it forces you to pay that mortgage, right? And that's, that's the equation that matters. It's not that you were so smart to buy a house in a great location and uh, God forbid you have any termites and black mold and, and other problems um, and costs, but it's that you would have spent that money otherwise. Morgan Housel has a great quote. He says, most people wanna be millionaires uh, but that's not actually what they want. They want to spend a million dollars. And that's the exact opposite of what it takes to be a millionaire, which is to save and invest. Uh, and thinking about that in terms of housing and really anything, you know, stock investing too. Uh, you know, you put money in the market. We were um, talking to, I was giving a speech in, in Ireland at Trinity College and I was talking to some students in uh, pre-pandemic. And I said, you know, I think it was around spring break time. And I said, you know, Many of you are considering going to, I don't know, uh, Ibiza, uh, the Mediterranean, whatever it is for spring break. And, you know, there's a cost to that. Maybe you're backpacking, but let's say it's $1,000, $2,000. I say, or, you know, you could hang out here and, uh, you know, not spend that money and put it in an investing account. And in 25 years, that 10 X's in 50 years at 100 X's. And would you like to have 200 grand at, at retirement? Like, that'd be pretty awesome, right? Can you have empathy with your future self? Can you lock it away that long? 
I said, now the correct answer is probably to go to Ibiza. You may meet your future mate and probably a lifetime of memories. But ha- thinking in terms of how do I 100x my money just by putting it away in a lockbox uh, and letting it sit and just compound, you know, is is a hard task. But that's what builds the wealth over time. It shows how much I, I like and enjoy reading your blog post is that I know you brought up black mold because you have personal experience with that. But what I love about your blog post though too is like- Too you just soon, said too soon. Yeah, your transparency and then also skin in the game. So my understanding is like you built your tail ETF for your own specific needs. Is that fair? And, and tell me about the tail ETF. You know, I put all of my public assets into our funds. Uh, you know, and my goal in launching these funds are that they're things I want to invest in. And, and we manage about a little over a billion dollars across the fund lineup. And, um, but going back to the earlier criteria, you know, there's plenty of other categories where Vanguard is just fine. And, uh, you know, we're honest about that and say, we'll use funds from, I think we use funds from over a dozen different companies. So tail, uh, we wrote a paper called, uh, worried about the market, maybe it's time for the strategy or something, a number of years ago. And the thesis was, we were looking at um, a publicly traded fund that would be something like an inverse or tail hedge fund and uh, weren't um, happy with the, the publicly traded choices out there. And so we wrote a paper with this thesis and was let's say you have a great portfolio. Um, you know, what are the steps? Most people own US stocks. What are the steps to start to diversify away from that and protect when that biggest risk, which the vast majority of investors have in the US, if you talk about their allocation, it's mostly stocks. Even if it's 60, 40, stock risk dominates that portfolio. Uh, so the volatility, everything is determined like 90% by the stock allocation. and of the stock allocation, they usually put about 80% in the US. So the foreign's irrelevant. So it's basically your portfolio is US stocks. How do you diversify that? And we kind of walk through the ways and the common sense methods. The first one is uh, if you have too much of a risk, you don't have to take that risk. I mean, this applies to anything. If you have 100% of your portfolio in crypto and you can't sleep, don't own 100% in crypto, right? And so if you have 100% stocks and it's too much and it's giving you night sweats because you know that they've declined 85% in the past uh, and it might happen again, well, just don't own so much. That's simple. People don't like hearing that. Um, You can diversify into other asset classes, foreign stocks, real assets, bonds. Uh, You can invest in certain strategies like value or momentum and trend and do all these things. However, let's say you still want to hedge that stock allocation, and we can get into this, why particularly now is is probably uh, a really thoughtful time to be doing that. Uh, This is well known by almost everyone. It seems to be at this point almost a game of musical chairs where uh, every big shop out there says this is probably the worst opportunity set for 60-40 in history. Bonds, you know, bonds you can with certainty say, they're going to do about 2% for the next 10 years on, on a nominal basis. I'm rounding up. I'm, I'm generous. I'm an optimist. Uh, and stocks are probably about the same, unfortunately. We're at a long-term PE ratio. I love using CAPE ratio. Everyone loves to dunk on that. So pick your poison of the, any 50 other indicators on valuation, most of which are at an all-time high, uh, you know, sentiment, et cetera. And so we're, we're looking at low single digits for U.S. stocks. Um, so CAPE ratio is, is more modest than most of them, by the way, but it's at 36, maybe 37. I think we hit an all-time high for reference, the high in 90s. When I was in college, it was 45, so I'm ready for that to be taken out. Uh, but it's been as low as five in history, and on average, it's around 17. Uh, but other countries have gone crazier. You've had India and China were in the 40s and 60s and the two, mid-2000s. Other countries, Japan, uh, my favorite bubble, hit almost 100 in, in the 80s. Uh, and that was no just like tiny economy that wasn't like it's like, you know, Greece or something. I mean, Japan was the biggest stock market in the world at the time, and, and it's still a top three economy. So 6040, looking at this and saying, look, we're, we're uh, the first thing you can do is say, look, diversify, do all these other things, move your expectations low, take your medicine, uh, swallow your Advil, celebrate your gains, which, by the way, for U.S. stocks, uh, is not normal. 
if you look at decades going back to 1900, U.S. stocks versus the rest of the world, uh, the U.S. beat everything and beat the average in the, in the 20 uh, teens. It happened also in the 90s. But before that, it, it hadn't happened since 1910s. So for the people that are planning on projecting U.S. stock dominance forever, uh, take, take a look at history. That's, that's a, uh, not normal. Getting back to tail risk. So once you have these risks and understand them and say, look, okay, maybe I want to hedge this. Uh, what are my choices? And, and if you look at all the asset classes, when U.S. stocks have a haymaker, bad day, month, quarter, down 20, which has certainly happened many times in the past, what has helped? And the things you expect not to help don't. Foreign stocks don't help. Real estate doesn't help. Commodities doesn't help. The things you expect to help, uh, bonds, they help on average. Not a ton, but they help. Uh, commo- uh, gold, it's like your crazy cousin helps sometimes, doesn't help sometimes, but on average it helps. And then trend following helps, but then something like tail risk, you can't say guarantee in our world, but is almost guaranteed to help uh, because you're literally buying puts. And the way, sorry, the way we outlined in the paper was something as simple as uh, you're just, you're buying a, a ladder of puts on, and rolling it on the, on the stock market. So just like insurance, right? Life insurance, car insurance, it's a, it's a monthly premium until it gets whacked and then it, and then it helps. So in the paper, we paired it with bonds and showed that on average, this, this is something that uh, could be very useful either as a tactical investment, as an all the time behavioral hack. So think back to last year when you're watching the futures overnight and they're down 7% and everything's red on your screen. Does it help you get to the finish line by at least having something that's green and not panicking and selling everything if that's part of your plan that we referenced earlier, right? Your written plan. But the really interesting takeaway for me is presumably a lot of people listening to this uh, are also involved in the asset management financial world. And so we said in the appendix, which no one probably got to, we said, if you look at uh, your personal exposure as a financial advisor, let's say you're a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley, you don't know, but you're probably four times leveraged the stock market. You own stocks in your own accounts, in your retirement, in your families, U.S. stocks. Uh, your revenue is directly tied to the stock market because your client portfolios, if they go down 50%, your revenue just went down 50%. Clients often panic when times are bad. So they may leave at market bottoms, in which case your revenue goes down more. And if you don't own your own company, you have the risk of getting fired because the stock market and buy and hold is heavily tied to the real world economy. So recessions, uh, you know, unemployment going up, it's all highly correlated. So you can make an argument that the average financial professional should own no U.S. stocks. In fact, they should hedge them the same way a corporation would hedge their main risks, like a, a jet uh, airline company may hedge the cost of, of oil or jet fuel. A food company may hedge the cost of their inputs, whether it's wheat or soy or corn. Everyone else does this in corporate America. Uh, asset managers don't and financial planners don't. We do. Going back to the early part of this discussion on corporations talking about their balance sheet, we own a big slug of this tail risk fund in uh, on our corporate balance sheet. I own it as a huge portion of my own personal investments uh, for that same reason. And so... Um, no one else really agrees with this sort of way of thinking. Uh, I've talked to a couple of big asset managers that have implemented a similar concept. So we're, we're a bit oddballs here. But if you think about it, um, to me, it, it makes a lot of sense. Because again, the whole point of this entire investing world is to stay in the game. Uh, and so having money when it hits the fan, whenever that may be, uh, but 2020 is a good example, does it help you survive? Does it help you sleep at night? Does it help you get to the promised land? To me, that's that's the whole point. Yeah, the best compliment we could ever get is is survivorship, right? It's just surviving. I actually I link your uh, your quad leverage paper to financial advisors all the time. I don't I'm not sure they really want to see that. The other way we like to talk about it is my my partner Taylor Pearson has coined this term entrepreneurial put option with using tail risk because like. I like to talk to financial advisors about their clients. If they're an entrepreneur or a business owner, then they also own a house, they own cars and collectibles. They're already quadruple leveraged to long GDP, which is stock beta. So why are you adding more leverage to the stock market for them? You should be thinking about that tail risk, you know, hedging. 
you know, when you're talking about you're combining it with the bonds, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like 85%, seven to 10 year bonds. Like, why did you include the bonds? Is, is that because you had to include something in the ETF and that seemed the most prudent allocation or? Yeah. So the way we do it, look, there's infinite permutations. People ask us all the time and say, Matt, right. why do you? So in the ETF, we do a ladder of puts from three to 15 months. We roll it every month. We target about a percent of assets under management each month. That has an added benefit of when volatility is super expensive, think in March 2000, when VIX is at like 80, you're buying a lot less puts than when it's at 15, like it is today. Um, to me, that seems a little bit like common sense. And um, what's the moneyness of them too? Like, we, we, it tends to be sort of zero to 10% out of the money. So, okay. um, and then we just let it float. And so, you know, the, the profile is that you should roughly expect a one to negative one return stream in the bad times. So if the uh, market went down 10% tomorrow, we would roughly expect this fund to be up 10. And you want to lose less when, when times are, uh, are good, which is the whole point. Like you want to be losing money on this fund most of the time, because that means stocks are, are ripping and roaring. And so we actually just launched a foreign version of it as well. So we have tail and fail, uh, and we may have bail and jail if we ever get to the bond portions <laughs> as bond yields go up. Um, but, you know, thinking about it as, as um, the bond exposure, you know, people ask us all the time, say, well, why don't you use long bonds or zero coupon? Why didn't you use gold? There's a million different ways to do it. Yeah. You know, and this applies to all of our funds. Why do you own 100 stocks instead of 50? And so, you know, you have to settle on something. And for me, it's always like, what do I want to do? Like, what do I want to put my own money into? And am I okay with it? Does it check the box for me? A lot of it is, is it simple? Can I understand it? Is there a narrative that's just basic and makes sense? Um, I'm not trying to optimize on, on a certain outcome. And so we settled on 10-year bonds. Look, would 30 be fine? Would T-bills be fine? Would zero, yeah, They would all probably be fine. Would tips be fine? You know, bonds historically, again, have helped when it hits the fan. Usually they move to bonds. Uh, and you've seen the opposite over the since March, right? Bond yields have gone up, which is good in a way, because I think it helps reset the sort of uh, capital gains possibilities when it does hit the fan. But again, going back to the house insurance, life insurance, best possible thing is your house doesn't burn down. Like you don't want your house to burn down if it does you certainly want that insurance. So to me, it's it's so much time we spend in our world optimizing on, hey, what's like the efficient frontier? Like what is the best investments? How do we optimize for the best return? And to me, the vast majority of individuals and institutions I talk to, they may say they want that, but it's not what they really want, right? They, they want something uh, that probably is a little bit smoother, has a little bit lower volatility and, and draw down the losses because people people don't really freak out. 10% down in their portfolio, they're grumpy. 20%, and, and it's, it is exponential kink, right? It's a power law every 10% after that. 20%, you're probably fired. They move to someone else. Uh, and then on down 30, 40, 50, you can't really find an asset allocation that that doesn't lose a third at some point in history. 60, 40 in every country around the world has lost two thirds, by the way, listeners. So that's your base rate, uh, you know. Um, so I think it was 63% uh, roughly in, in the 1930s that 60, 40 yeah. would have lost, something like that. Yeah. So uh, if you are if you survive and, and lose only a quarter or a third at some point, God bless you, you've done, uh, you've done better than most. Yeah, and I think about, this isn't, um, like you said, there's a thousand permutations and we can talk about them ad nauseum. So it's not second guessing what you created. I just want to point out a few of the pros and cons of like, of your put ladders is, you know, the closer you are to the money, the higher the bleed is going to be understandably. Also with a lot of ETFs, um, a lot of them are going to use a fixed spend for, you know, tail risk, which is great. Like you're saying, if while we're in risk on, um, it gets cheaper and cheaper right before the crash, which is fantastic. But if we have a second or third leg down, it's hard to get adequate coverage. So I'm just curious of like how you mentally went through those calculations when you're creating exactly what you wanted. Well, I, I had spent like six months building an options database uh, on my own by scratch, uh, trying to implement infinite variants and then realize we could get 90% of the way there with some like published CBOE indices. So exactly. that was a wasted summer. Could have could have been better spent surfing and skiing. I don't know. But to me, again, like I'll be the first to tell you like this isn't a good investment strategy. You know, uh, you 
don't want to buy this fund and hold it for the long time because eventually you'll you'll lose all your money. And that's an odd statement from from someone uh, as the fund manager, but but it's the truth, you know. And and so hey, you want to short this fund and get short bond exposure and and short options. Hey, you you short puts. Uh, that's fine with me too. And but understanding any asset class, any strategy over time has its day in the sun and, and its day in the shade. And so if we did this interview in mid 2000s, what do we be talking about? We'd be talking about emerging markets and the BRICS and uh, real estate, just crushing it. US stocks would be laughing about, we're like, what a joke, you know, they, they popped in 99, 2000, and, and it's been a decade and nothing. Uh, if you went over to Japan and we were having some beers and chat, chatting with Japanese investors, they'd be saying, who invests buy and hold? Like, that's not even a thing. It's been 30 years. Uh, ironically, the market's breaking out and doing great over the last couple of years. But 30 years, that bubble where most of their assets went down 80 percent, you know, and uh, or more. So uh, thinking about the, the sort of tail risk stuff, you know, to me, it's um, it's so easy to optimize in our world of quant and history and data, but the reality is you're trying to come up with something that uh, is survivable somewhere in the middle. So yeah, um, we eventually settled on sort of that portfolio, but uh, look, there's there's plenty of variants that are, are probably just fine for the state of goals. Yeah, like you said, they, but you get that structural negative correlation. So I almost push back a little bit on what you said, but I, I think you're right. That like, if you just held that, you know, you're going to bleed during risk on years quite substantially. But it's about the pairing with a structurally negative correlated, like with 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 your stock portfolio, and that rebalance over time can help compound your wealth. But more importantly, it provides you a convex cash position when you need it the most, so you don't make any stupid behavioral mistakes. So how do you think about like the pairing of like kind of those those two opposites? We did a uh, presentation this past year where we were talking about as the U.S. market is is kind of melting up, and for perspective, uh, listeners. By the way, we talk a lot about valuations, not so much yet today. But um, for reference, you know, the U.S. market we have it is you know, forty-five countries, the, the second most expensive in the world. Again, it's not as bad as '90s, but it's it's not good. Over 40 is where we start, in my opinion, is like pure bubble territory. Like you you start to consider um, really dialing that down and hedging it. But uh, but it's yellow light in my mind. Red light is when the trend rolls over. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, just for reference, foreign developed is totally reasonable, is trading at, I think, a, a long-term PE ratio in the low 20s. Foreign emerging is downright cheap, down around 15 uh, in the cheapest bucket, the 12 countries, uh, the cheapest in the world is, is down around 13. In many countries like UK, which is historically zigged and zagged with the US, uh, is it like 14. So you have one of the biggest valuation spreads in history, US versus foreign, in particularly the cheap stuff. And people say, well, no, no, there's a million reasons why US is allowed to be expensive historically. They say it's had a valuation premium. We have better companies, rule of law, stable geopolitics, all the way down the list. Um, but the reality is that there's been no historical valuation premium in the US. We ask people, what do you think it is? And they come up 20%, 50%, whatever. Uh, going back to the last 40 years, for example, there, there is none. It's the same valuation as, as foreign developed, which surprised a lot of people, but they oscillate, right? They horses trading places. Um, and sometimes foreign does, it's a coin flip any given year, 50-50 foreign versus the US. Now the US has outperformed over the past 70, 100 years. But what surprises people, you say, how much of that has come since the financial crisis, right? You've had this massive valuation, multiple expansion. Everything was trading in sort of the low teen valuations in 2009. The difference is the US has ripped all the way up to 37, where we are today, whereas the rest of the world hasn't so much. It hasn't caught up. So how much of that outperformance of U.S. versus the rest of the world has come since then? And the answer is all of it, which is crazy to think about, right? The uh, 70 years, that's a lifetime uh, for, for uh, most people, all the outperformance of the U.S. And it's cherry picking a little bit, but it's, but it's come in the last 10 years. So, so giving pause, but that's just some reference points. What was the original question? I've already moved on. I've already forgotten. What were we talking about? <laughs> how did I get into valuation? Yeah, I was just thinking actually about like how 
you know, like you said, we're, we're getting into bubblicious territory on like the U.S. stock market, but having something like a tail or tail risk or a tail ETF helps you comfortably sleep at night while still holding more maybe portion to equities than you normally should instead of dialing it back, which would be more appropriate is if you're still going to YOLO equities at these valuations, you probably need something like tail risk that has a, a structural oh, yeah. negative correlation and convexity compared with it. Right. So I forgot what I was going to say. My my presentation we did was it's called a tail of two tails. Like most people want to focus on the left tail and, and protecting the bad side. But you the whole point of the, the long term is you want the right tail. You want to be investing in businesses, great stocks over time that will help you compound. Um, and that's the whole point of this game. But you have to stay in the game. And so we said, look, if you want exposure to the right tail, the U.S. is melting up, but a better place to be, and this surprises lots of people, uh, I think over the last year, you've had sort of three inflection points. There was the bottom in March. You had interest rates in the U.S., uh, bottom, I think, summertime, and then the election. So you can pick your inflection point, but I think the regime has changed. You've seen small caps start to outperform. You've seen value really outperform. You've seen foreign outperform the dollar. On and on, commodities rip up. So I think you've seen the regime change already. But my point was on the right side, if if we are going to have a melt up or things are going to consider going up, consider foreign stocks because they're a lot cheaper. Consider the cheapest countries in the world. My favorite trifecta is cheap, hated, and in an uptrend. And so you see that. I mean, like, look at Europe, Eastern Europe, some of my favorite countries, Czech Republic, even the old pigs. Russia has been outperforming the U.S. over the last five years. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and they're in a single digit PE ratio. And so my exposure on the right side is I want global stocks. And a lot of people don't understand this. US is only half a world market cap. All the US investors listening to this put 80% in, in the US. And as a percentage of global GDP, it's only a quarter. So you can make the argument that you could or should have 50, 75% in, in foreign, 50% is the Vanguard starting point of a global index. So if you have 80, you have a massive overweight US stocks. So getting to 50, 75%, I think is totally reasonable. On top of that, if you're a market cap weighted investor, you're putting most of your money in the second most expensive stock market and the second most expensive it's ever been in history. Does that check the common sense box? I, you know, I don't think so. Uh, Templeton wrote about this 100 years, not, not quite 100 years ago, but uh, said, look, as valuations go up, just have less in stocks, you know, move from 80% to 60 to 40 to 20. Like that's, that's incredibly sound. So you want exposure to the right side. In my mind, it's much better in foreign emerging, the cheapest countries. On the flip side, to get there, yes, hedge, hedge your left side, hedge the, out, uh, the, the tail event. Um, we haven't gotten into trend following. I think that's another great way to go about that. Uh, but, but yes, the tail, to me, it, it covers both your bases, the, the right tail and the left tail. Because if we know anything about markets is that normal market returns are extreme. You know, they, they don't sit there and return 8% per year. It's plus 20, zero, minus 20, up 60. You know, it's all over the place. And so I think that's a, a thoughtful way to go about it. But vast majority of people, though are only exposed to one outcome. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. You actually said three or four things actually segue perfectly into talking about like the Trinity ETF. And, and so I, you know, a lot of family and friends, when if their first question to me and they're, they're newbie investors, the first place I send them actually is the, the Trinity white paper, um, just to learn about like proper diversification. But maybe we can start with that with what you alluded to at the very beginning, your favorite book is Triumph of the Optimist. And what does that tell us about like different asset classes over time? Good. Let's get you some more billionaire friends. I'm ready for some more flows. Um, <laughs> you know, as you think about the history of markets, uh, it's like watching Game of Thrones. You know, it is a history of crazy things happening. I think to be a good investor, you have to have an appreciation for history to at least give you a base case. Say, look, there's markets that have straight up gone to zero. China, Russia closed their capital markets Said, thank you very much. Uh, cultural re revolution, Bolshevik. I mean, they, there's been times the average country has gone through a two thirds loss, 80%, 90%. That's normal. You have uh, various outcomes. If you look back in history, the US has been one of the positive outliers, but a bit, it's a bit anomalous. You know, it went from 15% of world market cap in 1899 to 55% today, but other countries went from 25%, 15% to two. 
you know, if we were betting in 1899, you know, you and I were in a coffee shop in London, we'd probably be betting on Argentina. Exactly. And that has been an absolute basket case. Austria, one of the worst performing countries in the world. And I think the best, I'll have to update it, South Africa was up there, but obviously a much smaller market. So looking at the, the beauty of history, there's a lot of other takeaways. I love the 5 two, one rule. After inflation, stocks have roughly returned 5%, bonds around two, and I'm rounding up, and, and bills around one. Uh, you could probably, in, in today's interest rate world, call that maybe 510 or 500. But that's sort of the expectation. And then going back to what we talked about earlier, mixed in with periods where stocks can go an entire lifetime underperforming bonds. When we talk about Trinity, the background is the starting point we always tell people is the global market portfolio. If you were to go out and buy all the assets in the world, what does your portfolio look like? And it's roughly half stocks, half bonds, and of that half US, half foreign. Uh, largest asset class in the world that US investors don't have exposure to is, is foreign bonds. I don't know hardly, I don't know really any investors that have exposure to foreign bonds, but that's roughly the world. And, and that's been a great portfolio over time. Um, what's the problems with that? Uh, the problems with that is that it's uh, market cap weighted. So if you go back to the 70s, the big, the big beauty and benefit of market cap weighting is allowed people to invest because you don't do anything uh, for almost no cost. So Vanguard is now a multi-trillion dollar asset manager because they figured this out. And it's a good portfolio. But the problem with market cap weighting is it has no tether to fundamentals whatsoever. It's it's a trend following portfolio, which we love trend following, right? Is as a stock goes up, you own more and more of it. And as it goes down, you own less. So you're guaranteed to own the winners and more of them, but there's no tether to fundamentals. And so you can do any other weighting methodology and come up with a percent or two better returns. You could equal weight, you could value weight, you could invest based on, you know, is a CEO wearing a hat or not? Uh, so it doesn't matter. That should outperform market cap weighting. But the big invention was that it was low cost. Anyway, I digress. This global market portfolio in 2021, it's an amazing time to be an investor because you can get it for zero. zero you know, I mean, it's four basis points or something as an ETF. And with short lending, that's probably negative. I mean, unbelievable, right? Like that's that's incredible. The problem with that though is, is buy and hold is, is tough. Investors as you mentioned earlier, like that portfolio is highly correlated to your life, your human capital, to GDP, to everything, to unemployment. That portfolio does poorly when everything else is hitting the fan. And so uh, that's hard. It's hard for a lot of people to watch it go down as it will and, and have normal uh, losses and drawdowns, 10, 20 percent and maybe 50 percent at some point. But the problem is you're losing the money when you don't want to be losing it, which is when you're probably unemployed, uh, great depressions, you know, when times are really bad. Think back to last year, you know, it feels like 10 years ago, but during the pandemic, when things were hitting the fan, uh, your portfolio is getting smacked too. So um, investment strategy we love, I mean, you can do things to help within that. You could tilt towards value that'll add returns. You can tilt towards momentum, but none of that is going to protect against the, the problems. So there's another investing strategy going back to the beginning of the conversation, coming full circle, talking about trend following, you know, our first white paper, a quant approach to tactical asset allocation, you know, outlined a very simple trend following approach on world assets. And it was simply you're invested in them as they're going up, uh, you exit to the safety of cash and bonds when they're going down. doesn't even matter what indicator you use. We use the 10-month moving average. You could use the 200-day. You could use breakouts, on and on and on. We published a, a companion paper during the pandemic that no one's read. Crypto friends will love it because the name of it is, uh, is investing at all-time highs a good idea? No, it's a great idea. And so we walk through investing in markets over time that is literally the dumbest in simplest investing methodology, which is you invest in a market if it's an all-time high, I think within five or 10%, I can't even remember. Uh, and if, you're, if it's not an all-time high, you're in cash and it creams buy and hold in every single asset class. Better is if you use a 12-month look back. Is it a 12-month high? Yes, I'm invested. If not, you're in cash. Again, with a, the 5% tolerance ban, creams buy and hold in every single asset class. Literally the dumbest, simplest, asset class, but people hate all-time highs, right? Like it's very uncomfortable to buy something at an all-time high. Anyway, 
trend following, the whole point of trend following uh, is that you want exposure to the big moves as things are going up and you want to exit and not be invested in something as it goes down 20, 40, 60, 80. It's probably not going to miss the 5, 10, maybe even 20% moves down. But you want to be out as it goes down. Something You want to avoid something going down 80, 90%. And why is that important? Because uh, drawdowns get exponentially worse the worse they get. So 10% is not that bad, but that's where the kink starts to happen. You know, you go down 20, you go down 50. If you go down 50, it's not a 50% gain to get back to even. It's 100. 75, it's 300%. So avoiding the big losses, historically, the research shows trend following, uh, you lower your volatility, you lower your drawdown by using this approach. What's the problem with that? Why doesn't everyone do trend following? Well, it has its own unique problems. The main one is you look different. Your neighbor's making hay in the stock market, uh, YOLOing in the calls and in GME and everything else, and uh, you're not. So that's hard for many people. Uh, the challenge of having multiple losers uh, or having a low batting average. People like certainty. They want to win with like 90% of their trades. <clears throat> but historically, trend following has a lower batting average, but it has the big winners and a lot of little losers. So the problem is both investing approach is difficult. Buy and hold is tough. Trend following is tough. Now, the good news is they tend to be a yin and yang. They tend to uh, trend following... If you look back 2020, first quarter, you say, my God, thank God for trend following because the world looks like it's going to zero. And why do I have money in buy and hold? Fast forward to the rest of the year, thank God for buy and hold. Markets ripped right back up and trend following probably lagged. And so to me, this concept, which we call Trinity, uh, combines the two. I did a poll on Twitter yesterday. I said, do you have any exposure to trend following? And trend following can mean a thousand different permutations. There's managed futures, there's long short, there's people that trade 100 markets around the world, there's people that trade only five. The big takeaway is you you have some sort of exit and, and you know, um, in many cases you can short too. And I asked people, I said, do you have any exposure to trend following? And it was like 80% said essentially zero or, or a de minimis amount. And the funny thing about trend following, you plug it into any blind asset allocation simulator and you're going to end up with like 20, 40, 50% in trend following. There was a paper, I think it was Goldman, who did a historical simulation and said, how much should you put in trend following? And the answer always was like half. And they're like, well, we have to correct the simulator because, I mean, we have to uh, constrain this because obviously that's crazy. No one's going to do that. I said, what are you talking about? You can't look back at the data just because you don't like it and say that's that's not right. But it, But it is right in the sense that so much in our world is driven by career risk and what allocator is going to put half in trend following. That's crazy. Well, we do. We're probably the biggest outlier, I think, in the entire country where half of our base case allocations are in trend following strategies in both the ETF and we have managed accounts that do it. And um, I think that's totally normal and sensible, but, but for most, that's the craziest thing in the world. So, uh, and we have some funds that purely do it. And trend following, you know, like anything, it's gone through its periods. I mean, it really shined during the financial crisis. Uh, but for most of the past decade has been kind of average to subpar. It's doing great again right now as, as bonds have been tanking. Most trend followers are short bonds and long commodities. Uh, so doing well again. But, you know, that's an investing approach that goes back hundreds of years. And uh, there's even a, a, a book that takes a 800 year back test, <laughs> Catherine Kaminsky um, on the topic. So yeah. it makes sense to us, but that's, uh, that's Trinity in a nutshell. Yeah, so thinking about you're holding the global liquid asset classes and stocks, bonds around the globe, you know, buy and hold, trend following. And it, I think was it in the original paper, maybe it was in one of the supplements, because I know you're a big fan of like farmland. How do you think about like real assets in combination with that if you were able to buy farmland or even commodity trend following? How do you think about that in proportion? So um, in the global market portfolio, there's a couple asset classes that are not well represented presented because there's not a lot of public choices available. Uh, the two biggies are farmland. Farmland historically has been dominated by individuals, families, family offices, and to a more modern extent, private funds and institutions like Harvard, Yale. 
but it, there's not a lot of public options. I think there's like two REITs maybe that do it, but it's notoriously, I mean, it's, it's one of the all time best asset classes because it's not correlated to any of the other assets uh, and it's had great returns. So that's not represented. Single family housing around the globe is probably another one. There's, there's more and more REITs that have come up with, with exposure to that. But in general, that's a massive asset class that is, is harder to allocate to, but, but certainly more than farmland. It wasn't in the paper, but it was in probably the article on how I invest my money, where I say, you know, mine is modeled after this sort of Talmud, a third in uh, businesses, startups. So for me, that's been these 200 plus startups, a third in sort of what I consider to be uh, reserve, which for most people would be bonds, but for me is Trinity, because I, going back to the safest portfolio, I think that's actually much safer than cash. And then lastly is the real assets. And for me, um, and the beauty of this for everyone listening is that asset allocation investing is very personal, you know, and, and many people have investments, think about your house. For me, it's farmland where it's not a sharp ratio optimization. You know, for me, it's a connection to my heritage and my family. Um, it's fun to go drive around the tractor at wheat harvest time. If anybody's going to be in Western Kansas, hit me up in, in June, uh, you know, and get, sort of have that family. Yes, it's a great investment, but really it's, it checks some other boxes too. Now it also checks the pain in the ass boxes. You know, we, we talked about a few years ago, we had a combine catch fire and burned down the entire crop. Like, the, you know, it happens. Same thing with the house, the black mold, you know, there's headaches. And so there's a very real argument to, to minimize those headaches. But uh, so that side to me is I would love there to be more. And we've done like half a dozen farmland investing podcasts uh, on the topic. And there's getting to be more choices out there. But uh, but I love that that part of the world uh, as well. Um, so that some there's some things you can include in the public markets or, or not, you know, in a way that I think is is challenging. And, and the crypto listeners, people love asking me, say, how do you think about this in the, in the global market portfolio? Where I say the simple answer is just allocate as a percentage of the global market portfolio. We're probably up to maybe one percent now. So. Put in a one percent position. That sounds comically low for most uh, most out there, but you know, it, um, if it goes up ten x, hallelujah! Now you have ten percent in, and uh, if it goes down, it's no no uh, no skin off teeth. So I think it's totally fine as a percentage of uh, the market portfolio as as well. One of my favorite papers you wrote actually is showing like if you have a global um, asset allocation portfolio, both liquid, illiquid, trying to create all those things, your actual portfolio weights don't matter as much as people think they do. Whether it's, you know, Talmud, permanent portfolio, risk parity, you know, IV portfolio, endowment portfolio, all of them are roughly the same over time. All of them end up having like a 25% drawdown. So it's like, don't stress yourself out too much. Just try to get broad exposure and, and rebalance over time. Is that fair? Yeah, that was in um, the global asset allocation book. And we did sort of a, a fun horse race test where we said, look, there's everyone is on the media all the time. Here's what I think your allocation should be. For Buffett, it's 90% stocks, 10% T-bills. For uh, you know the permanent portfolio of Harry Brown fame, it's a quarter each and stocks, bonds, real assets, and gold or something. I'm, I'm blanking on it. Um, but we took a dozen, two dozen portfolios, the most famous gurus, you know, uh, David Swinson of Yale, Rob Arnott Research Affiliates, uh, Muhammad El Arian, everyone. We said, how do they do back to the 70s? You can take it back to the 20s too. And the takeaway was what you just mentioned is they zigged and zagged all over the place. And the average spread between best and worst portfolio in any given year is like 30%, which is why people talk about it, right? Risk parity getting hammered this year, but endowment doing amazing, yada, yada, right? That's something to talk about. What's the Fed doing? What about gold? What about bonds, stocks, right? But over the full period, uh, you know, the, the asset classes are like a shotgun blast on the risk return. But if you zero in on the portfolios, it's like a rifle um, sharpshooter to where they're within about 1% spread on cager over time. I mean, it's unbelievable. Like there's, there's essentially no difference, you know, and, and again, some do better in the seventies than others. Some do better in the nineties than others, but over time, it really doesn't matter. So this goes back to the concept of how much you save and invest, how you implement it. Taxes are one of the biggest things that people absolutely totally neglect fees. Another one, 
but once you optimize optimize for all those ideas, it the actual portfolio doesn't make really any difference. And we walked through in the book, we said, if I were to give you a crystal ball and Jason go back to the 1970s uh, and say, you can implement this, you can pick out the single best portfolio, but you have to do it with the average mutual fund cost of that period. And that would have uh, taken the best performing allocation with perfect foresight and made it almost as bad as the worst. So the, the, the entire discussion of what people spend all their time worrying about, <laughs> the actual allocation over time for a buy and hold portfolio, and again, this is very specific to buy and hold, matters much less than people think. That's just, that's, that's just like a boring, sad takeaway, but it's the, it's the reality of, of, of it. Yeah, well, uh, prudence is always boring, I guess, at the end of the day. But also, it, it to me, it helps people not stress out so much. So maybe that's the that's the the happy takeaway. But I want to touch on a few quick things before we wrap up. Is even you know outside of financial markets, some of the other interesting things you do that I really enjoy is one you referenced Twitter polls earlier, and one of the ones I want to thank you for that I love during COVID, you put out a poll. I think it was every week or every biweekly that was like do you or somebody very close to you have COVID? And then every week that poll, you would see like the percentage like slightly growing over time. And it was a great sentiment indicator versus like all the noise around us. Uh, so I just want to thank you, but I'm, I'm curious if you have any takeaways from running that poll. You know, in the depths of Corona, we did a post and investors can go look it up in March is said investing in a time of Corona. And, and we said, look, it's scary. People are losing their minds. Uh, you're probably locked in your house reading this, but as a student, as an investing takeaway, as a student of history, you have to at least consider the bull and the bear case. And I described a scenario that laid out like to a T. Here's, you know, the bear case is hospitals are ill-equipped, they're overrun, a vaccine is not developed in time. Uh, de- emerging countries are, you know, massively impact. The, the world goes into a tailspin assets, you know, decline, you get a brief uh, uh, respite in the summer, and then a second wave hits in the fall, assets go down 80%, right? Like a total Armageddon scenario, which is what it felt like, by the way, in March. I said, but at the same time, you have to at least consider the bull case, you know, science prevails, vaccines are developed, uh, politicians you know, do a great job of coordinated global response uh, and markets are hitting new highs by year end. And people are like, that's effing crazy, Meb. That will never happen. And here we are. And so part of like the polls, you know, and, and sentiment, sentiment's notoriously squishy at extremes. And my favorite example is the AAII uh, poll that asks investors, you know, are you bullish stocks, are you bear stocks, or are you neutral? And it's getting pretty pretty bubbly right now. It's not all time high. The all time high most bullish people were on stocks was in December of 1999, the single worst month in the entire history of the US stock market to be bullish stocks because it was at the highest valuation. That's when people wanted the most stocks. It's absolutely insane. When were people most bearish? March of 2009. Like you can't make up a more ridiculous outcome to the survey, nailing it to exact moment. And so the problem with sentiment, of course, is, you know, uh, the magazine cover indicators, everything else. But so is, is a bit of it was to try to just take the, the pulse of what's going on in the world. And we have a, a pinned Twitter, uh, Twitter thread right now that I'm just adding all the signs of like the bubbly parts of markets right now. And it's, it's kind of difficult to read that thread and not want to sell all your stocks and, and uh, you know, hide out. But, um, but that's the thing about sentiment. But you, but the thing with markets, you always have to consider both sides. So many people uh, spend a lot of time when they have an investment, you have that psychological attachment to it, going back to your garage discussion, and they only look for c- confirming evidence all day. Hey, if you're a Tesla bull, what are you going to read all day? Articles about how Tesla is, is uh, going to go to 10 trillion market cap. If you're a Tesla bear, exact same thing, but to the opposite. But to be a great investor, what you should be doing is looking for the opposite, looking for holes in your thesis or holes in, in what could happen. And so part of part of that poll's intent uh, was to kind of see where we were and think about the possible um, various future outcomes. I mean, there, there's a old uh, Kenneth uh, Galbraith quote, and he's talking about forecasters. And he's like, there's, there's the ones that uh, 
can't predict the future and the ones that don't know they can't predict the future. Like there's only two types. And most people, we always say that the people would be much better. They, they want to be Nostradamus, right? They want to predict the future all day on Twitter. This is what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. It doesn't even matter what it is, crypto, stocks, on and on. Uh, but they'd much, we always say they'd be much better being Rip Van Winkle, you know, investing, forgetting about it, waking up in 10 years and, and not mucking around with it. But, but that's, the, that's the allure of it. But at least consider the, the various outcomes because that's what history is, right? It's, it's a constant surprise of good and bad. So this is going to be very rude, but for all the content you put out on portfolio construction, all the great work you've done, probably my favorite piece though, was when you aggregated the best recipes around the world. <laughs> and that's what I probably share with people the most. So as a foodie, I'm really appreciative of that. You know, why did you like, was that just figuring out your own cookbook? Are you going to publish a cookbook with those, those top recipes or? I'm, I'm a quant man. And you know, uh, if you take recipes at its core, and let's ignore Noma, let's ignore um, you know the the top one percent of restaurants, but the vast majority, uh, it's just a formula. And if I give you a basic recipe, you should be able to replicate it if you're you know a reasonable cook. And um, my point was, and again going back to the curation topic, all the top ten recipe sites they may have ratings, but they don't even let you sort by ratings. They don't let you sort by uh, stars. And so I I paid a guy in Poland. 500 bucks and it should have been 50 bucks because he did it in like 10 minutes, but scrape all the sites uh, and give me a sortable ranking of, you know, it's going back to like the rotten tomatoes is I just want food that is a chance if it's 95% uh, five star ratings and there's 10,000 10, ratings, it's probably a chance it's pretty good versus the one that's one star and, and zero ratings. And so, you know, um, we went through it and we came up with what we call the best recipes in the world. Maybe it should be a cookbook. Listeners, if you want to do it, hit me up. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to assist and fund the project. And we went through and cooked them. And it's a lot of, you know, crowd pleasers, lasagna, chocolate chip cookies, that sort of stuff. You're never going to get probably sous vide uh, salmon with a, with a you know, lemon dill foam. But um, you will get stuff that probably everyone would be happy with. But again, it goes back to that curation topic. I, I'd like someone else to do it. I, it's too much work, but uh, I, I love I love cooking, so it's a it's a fun uh, distraction. I can't wait for the hate we're going to get on this one, especially on Real Vision and Twitter. But you and I have both been philosophically pro Bitcoin for a long time. We both own Bitcoin and other cryptos. But just like you, there, it always seems to be an A or B argument. There's a, either it's extremely bullish and, and, and vitriol on that side or extremely bearish, right? It's either going to a million or it's going to zero. But you and I have this idea of what about option C? You know, what if it's kind of middling and quite frankly, it's, it's boring and it's not worth talking about. So, you know, how, how do you deal with the world where you just don't want to talk about the thing everybody wants to talk about because you find it, it as a, frankly, a boring topic? You know, I'm a supporter uh, of the crypto space. Like you mentioned, we have the HODL ticker. I would love to launch a, a crypto ETF for 25 basis points, disrupt that whole space. But uh, SEC is not adamant about getting anything out anytime soon. You often don't find in the world the loudest voices are at the extremes, politics, religion, anything. And, uh, you know, you find a lot of opinions in the middle is often you know, there's nothing to argue about. We actually talk about this in asset allocation investing. We say vast majority of people, probably 90% of the big muscle movements, what we talked about earlier, savings, living within your means, investing in businesses, on and on, paying uh, not a ton of the government through taxes. Like, most people can agree with that. Like those are the, so what do we spend all our time arguing about? It's like the final 5% or 1%, like is Greece cheaper than the US? You know, things that, probably aren't going to have a massive impact. And, and it's the same sort of thing in, in the crypto world. Um, you know, we talk about a lot of approaches, like, again, the trend following and all time high stuff is applies wonderfully to, to the crypto space. So it, I, I, I enjoy the roller coaster. I enjoy watching, uh, you know, to me, I, it's a portion of my asset allocation because it checks the Bezos bucket of regret minimization. You know, I I uh, I want to I want to be there if it goes to a million. Um, but uh, but to me, ninety nine times out of a hundred, actually a hundred times out of a hundred, investing in startups and following that world. I I love telling people, even if you don't have any money, go sign up for AngelList, um, particular WeFunder. 
and follow all the syndicates on there because you'll see thousands of companies over the course of five years you'll see uh, you know, the pitches. And at worst cases, you get ideas for your own companies or you get ideas to implement in your own life. It's such an optimistic world versus you know, public markets is, is defined by sort of negativity. And to see these world changing biotech and aerospace companies, I mean, like invested in the companies doing the first commercial space station. To me, that's what like gets my juices flowing or, you know, potential cures for cancer and mRNA or startups that are um, tackling inequality and, and opportunity in emerging markets. It, it, to me, like I get really excited about that. So, uh, but to each their own, you know, um, whatever, uh, whatever floats your boat. Some people would say what we do is, <laughs> is, is boring too. So who knows? Yeah, exactly. And that's why I, I do want to highlight, like, I've really enjoyed you talking about all your private investments and those hundreds of VC investments. And I want to highlight what you said about, you've been a great cheerleader for QSBS. I really recommend people go look that up. Um, and, and how that gives you a lot of optimism, just looking at all those um, entrepreneurs creating amazing businesses. But last question, you've you put it out there publicly that you would love to run CalPERS uh, with low, low, you know, low cost ETFs. Have you ever any feedback, any traction on that? Has anybody at CalPERS reached out to you? I applied. I, uh, I, I went through the, the, the application <laughs> and uh, I, I'll have to check. I'll look it up. But they hadn't responded last I checked very publicly. I've said this on, on Twitter many times. I said, look, the vast majority of institutions have a needlessly complex allocation setup. CalPERS is, my God, uh, probably the worst where they have hundreds, if not thousands of employees. They're doing this needlessly. And we did a post online that said, should CalPERS be managed by a robot? That just showed that CalPERS basically owns the global market portfolio. So in 2020, you can do that for free, right? They, uh, you can just buy a basket of ETFs and be done. And so this applies, listeners, if you are a big institution, this, uh, the offer stands. I will manage your portfolio. I will charge $0.00. I will put it in a basket of ETFs. And once a year, we can do a committee meeting. Uh, we'll have some beers. We'll talk about it. We'll rebalance it. And that's it. And you can fire your entire staff. You can uh, streamline operations and probably save hundreds of millions of dollars. We actually have a uh, asset, alloc asset allocation ETF. At the time we launched, it was the first ETF with a 0% management fee. So it's a fund to fund. So it's like 30 something basis points. Uh, and that ignores the short lending rebates, so it's actually cheaper. And that fund will, I, I will say it confidently here, outperform the vast majority of institutions over time. You can quote me, you can quote me on that one over the next 10 years. So uh, that's a great, uh, a great benchmark for the investable endowment in uh, institutional world. CalPERS, if you're listening, hit me up. Please do. Well, Matt, I appreciate your time. Hopefully next time we talk on Real Vision, it'll say CIO of CalPERS. But uh, thanks again for coming on. It's great to be back. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the real world soon. Yeah, fingers crossed. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.